password. All right, the message for this morning is, are you in a cult? Um, we're going to be looking at that. Uh, if you believe the King James Bible, you will be labeled as a cult. Okay, so we're going to see who really is part of a cult. Now, I'll begin by saying that the word cult is not in your King James Bible. In fact, if you have a Webster's 1828 dictionary, cult is not even in there. Okay, it's a recent word that was made up. So I had to look it up in a modern dictionary, and here's there's three definitions. Number one, a system of religious worship or ritual. Number two, devoted attachment to or extravagant ad admiration for a person, principle, etc., especially when, especially when regarded as a fad. And the third definition is a group of followers, sect. Okay, now that brings us to the Bible word, sect. Okay, now Webster's 1828 does have the definition for sect. And it is in your King James Bible. And the definition is a body or number of persons united in tenets, chiefly in philosophy or religion, but constituting a distinct party by holding sentiments different from those of other men. Most sects have originated in a particular person who taught and propagated some peculiar notions in philosophy or religion and who is considered to have been its founder. Question. Are we part of a sect? Yes. Okay, that's not a bad thing. All right. Who's our founder? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay, it's kind of interesting because we were on this, on doing a, a street thing one time, passing out tracts. Sorry. The Jesus Christ of the Bible. Yeah. The King James Bible. The Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. That's right. Not the Jesus of Jehovah's Witness or Mormons. Or Catholics. Or, Catholics. or, you know, yeah. That's right. Good, yeah, clarify that. But anyhow, we were out there on the street ministry the one time we ran into this older uh, gentleman, and he was very, you could tell he was a very educated man, and he said, I don't want to offend you or anything, but to me, he said, he said, do you consider yourself to be part of a cult? Well, the the Bible term is sect, you know, and, and of course the guy that he was talking to, I was standing there, but the guy he was talking to didn't quite understand. He took it as an insult, you know. But in reality, yes, we are part of a sect. Our founder is Jesus Christ. We don't question his teachings. And a true Bible believer believes that we are the ones who are right and everybody else is wrong. And the world hates that. Oh, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong? Yes, absolutely. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He is the only true faith. Okay? That's just the way it is. But uh, we're going to look about this thing of a sect. The word sect appears five times in the King James Bible. Three times it's a reference to Jewish groups like the Pharisees and things like that. Those references, we're not going to go to them for sake of time, but Acts 5.17, uh, 15, verse 5, and chapter 26, verse 5. Okay, those three places, most of them talks about the sect of the Pharisees or whatever. But now let's go to Acts chapter 24. And we'll see where Bible-believing Christianity is called a sect. Acts chapter 24, verse 1. <clears throat> and here, of course, you have the trial of Paul. It says here, And after five days Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. Uh, an, an orator. Okay, this guy uh, is a speaker, professional speaker. Verse 2, And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. <laughs> See how they, uh, you know, speak to the politician, you know, kind of talk nice to them so they get their respect. Butter yeah, them butter them up. Yeah, exactly. Okay, verse 4. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. Verse 5. For we have found this man, Paul, a pestilent fellow, 
and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. See? That's how the lost world views you, if you're a Christian. Oh, you're a, you're a part of that sect of the Nazarenes. Okay? Yeah, we are Christians. That's correct. Acts chapter 28, verse 22. We'll go over there next. We'll see the other reference to this. And of course, Paul, if you can, if you read the story there in the book of Acts, Paul is, is being brought before trial and he appeals to Caesar. Okay, because he sees that he's not going to get a fair trial, so he says, I appeal to Caesar. He actually used the fact that he had citizenship in Rome to avoid being, you know, killed from these people. He said, I appeal to Caesar. So they take him to Caesar and he goes the whole way up there and the Jews there actually aren't in cahoots, if you will, with the other ones. And it says here, verse 22, Acts chapter 8, or chapter 28, verse 22, they say, the, the Jews speaking to Paul, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So they hear, they're hearing about this Christianity, but they don't really understand it. Okay, they're open-minded. They're willing to listen. Okay, and now that's, one of the first things that you will know about a real cult in the world is they're not willing to listen. They will not allow you to even speak. Now, any time that you stand for the King James Bible, you will run into people that will not even hear you. I don't want to hear about it. I, you know, I think all of us here could say we've been through that. Where you try to give somebody a book, you try to give them a video, you try to give them a tract. No, I don't want it. I don't want it. You're wrong. You're divisive. You're this. You're that. They'll, they'll blast you, but they will not read your information. Don't confuse me with facts, you know. I, I don't want to hear about it. We're not even going to go there, they'll say. Okay, these people were not that way. They wanted to hear. Uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13 also is a very important verse in your Bible. It's, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Now, when you run into somebody that doesn't want to listen to you and they just, no, 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 and you can't get anywhere with them, when they are judged someday, it's going to be their problem, not yours. Don't be disappointed if you can't get through to somebody, okay? If they will not hear you, it's their problem. Right. Folly and shame unto them. Uh, one of the ways that you can tell that you're dealing with a cult, by the way, on the subject of Proverbs 18, verse 13, he that answereth the matter before he heareth it is folly and shame unto him. When you deal with somebody and you try to give them information, they say, I don't want anything to do with it. They're actually the one that's in the call. Here at Bible Believers Fellowship, we won't refuse any kind of information. Out there in my library, I have Catholic catechisms. I have just about every book written against the King James Bible. We have all kinds of stuff as part of this ministry. Why should we be afraid of any kind of information? Right. You know? and, we're, and we're commanded to prove all things. Hold prove. Past that which is First Thessalonians 5.21. Yeah. If you're a Christian, you need to do that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, look at verse 24 there. Paul basically it tells them about, you know, what is Christianity, what this sect is all about. And uh, verse 24 says, And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. Uh, that's the way it's going to be. Verse 25, And when they departed not among them, or when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Okay, verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Okay, the Jews as a nation rejected Jesus Christ. They didn't want to be part of the sect of the Nazarenes, as it was called. But notice there, these people, it's not... Oh, nobody ever told me. I, I didn't know. I, I'm innocent. No. They close their eyes. They close their ears. I don't want to hear. I don't want to know. Don't talk to me about that stuff. Okay? 
because they know it would change their lives. Now, if we are part of a sect, what does the Bible have to say about that? How should we live? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to hit just a couple verses here to show you this thing of that we are right and everybody else is wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that you should be arrogant. It doesn't mean that you should you know, just be a jerk to people. But it does mean that you have to take a stand for the truth and not back down. And we'll see about that in just a minute here. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. How is that possible with 200 new versions? It isn't. And yet, they accuse us of dividing. I would have a lot more sympathy towards new version people if they were saying... The King James Bible is not God's word, but the NIV is God's perfect word. And don't use anything but the NIV, but they don't ever teach that. It's, there's no Bible. You use whatever you prefer, see? That's why I'm against the new versions. Okay, it's, it's just wickedness. It's of the devil. Turn over to Philippians chapter 1. We're going through this right now in our Bible study. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians 1.27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now how's that going to look from somebody who's lost? They're going to look at you as a cult, as a sect. That's just the way it's going to be. Okay, uh, jump down to chapter 2, verse 2 there. It says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So you see it again there. And there's a lot more we could get into, but for sake of time, we're not going to. But you see that as Christians, that it doesn't mean that we're all going to dress the same way and that we're, you know, we're going to have all these peculiar things and stuff. No. You know, and when it's kind of funny because when people start doing that, when they start messing around with dress codes and things that are not in the Bible, you know, the Bible does teach modest apparel. But when people start getting off into that other stuff, they start getting messed up. Our unity is to be based on the Scripture, okay? And you don't fake that with a bunch of other things that you yourself create. But when you do that, the world is going to view you as a sect. That's just the way it is. And I know of people that, you know, oh man, well, I, I don't want to be viewed that way. I, you know, I, I want people to respect me. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. You see, what's the basis for unity in this world? A denial of absolute truth. Let's get a room and we'll put a Roman Catholic there and a Muslim there and a Buddhist there and a Hindu there and, you know, a Baptist here and a, you know, Lutheran over there and a, Okay, let's all get together. What do they have to do? They all have to deny their beliefs as being absolute truth. That's the way that unity works in this world. Denial of absolute truth. How does unity work within the body of Christ? Acceptance of absolute truth. Amen. You know, when we say you should only use a King James Bible, we're trying to bring unity, mm -hmm. not division. Okay? Now, will it cause division? Well, absolutely, yeah. The truth does divide people. We have a good message on that. You know, Jesus Christ is the divider. There's a lot of scripture to prove that. Okay? Truth does divide people. But it divides us into something that's unified. We look and we see the error and we say, I don't want anything to do with that. I will accept the truth over here. Okay? So this... This whole thing of people, oh, we have to get along in order to be Christ-like or something. Don't fall for that. Okay, turn next to Romans chapter 12. We're going to look now at why the vast majority of people will reject absolute truth. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. 
Now, this is something that a lot of modern Christians can't stand. It says here, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You see, salvation, I mean, the point was made Thursday night, which is a very good point. Salvation is a free gift, but it doesn't end there. Okay? If somebody gives you a free gift of a car, there's now a lot that goes along with that. You have insurance. You have registration. You have gas. You have maintenance. You, there's a lot of things that go along with that. Okay? It will cost you something to be a Christian. And we're going to look here in the next verse that there are different levels of Christianity. Okay? There are different levels that you can attain to. It doesn't mean that some that you have to be more in, intellectual and, and everything. No. It's just when it comes to sacrifice, there are people who sacrifice more than others and as a result they're more you know the lord will do things more with you when you sacrifice more look at verse 2 it says and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god we've been over this in other messages but i just want to hit it again but notice it says there in the very first line be not conformed to this world you cannot be worldly. Remember, what is the standard for conforming to the world? Denial of absolute truth. That's how you conform to the world. That's how you will be accepted by the world. Okay? They have these bumper stickers. You see them every once in a while with all the different religious symbols, and it says coexist. See? No, you can't do that. I heard a good message uh, by Greg Miller. It was on the Internet, and he said... The fact of the matter is that we need to realize we worship Jesus Christ and everybody else worships the devil. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Oh, no, no, come on. It was just a slightly different thing, and we need to respect their culture. No. They worship the devil. If you are not a worshiper or a follower of Jesus Christ, you worship Satan. So, oh, no, I worship Allah. No, you worship Satan. I worship Mary. I pray to Mary. She's she's my go between between. She's the medi mediatrix. No, you worship the devil. Period. And see, people can't stand that. They want to be. You need to respect me. No, I don't. I need to warn you because you're on a path to hell. See, and that's what people hate. And it's interesting because what is the move of the Antichrist? To bring all nations together. To bring all religions together. Okay. Don't be part of that system. But look at the thing there. It's there's three wills of God. The good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Now, imagine for a minute that you walk into a store. And, of course, all of us have done that at some point, And you see something that you really like. And it's not just a like, it's a need. And you go over to that thing, and you pick it up, and you go, Oh, man, this is perfect. I wonder what the price is. And you look underneath, or you look at the tag. Whoa, it's expensive. I don't have that kind of money on me. And you look and there's two cheaper models right there. Okay, keep that in mind as we're going through this study. Christianity, the life of sanctification, after you get saved, when you start to present your body as a living sacrifice, there's the perfect, there's the acceptable, and there's the good. Guess which one is the most expensive? The perfect. And a lot of people look at the price tag on the perfect will of God and they say, I don't think I want to pay that high of a price. But it's interesting because a lot of times when you see that, when you're in that situation and you pay a lesser price and you get the cheap one, mm -hmm. a year down the road you wish you had gotten the better one. And that's how it is with Christianity. When you go, you know, El Cheapo <laughs> with your sanctified life with the Lord and you, and you compromise, a lot of times later down the road in your life you say, you know what, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I would have gone on that to the mission field, or I wish I would have preached, or I wish I would have whatever. But now it's too late. I wasted my whole life. A lot of Christians get into that. So first we're going to look at the perfect level. We're going to look at the cost of it. Okay, what is the cost of the perfect will of God? Your life. It means a lot of study, hours and hours and hours and hours of study. It means... Uh, being uncomfortable <laughs> quite a bit 
okay? And uh, you're not going to be popular with the lost world. And I'm going to show you some scriptures to back that up. This is one that most people will just, this, they'll stay away from this scripture. They'll avoid it like the plague. Luke chapter 14. It's interesting. You go through the Gospels sometime, read through the Gospels, and you'll see a lot of times where Jesus had a lot of people following him, and he would say something, and they would say, this is a hard saying. You know, I don't, boy, I don't know about this. And after that, a lot of them would fall away and they wouldn't walk with Jesus anymore. You know? What a device of God. Yeah, <laughs> it's divisive. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Here's a hard saying for you. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. How about that? That doesn't mean that you have to go up to your family and say, I hate you. No, it doesn't mean that. That's not what it means. What it means is, if your family's going one way and Jesus Christ is going the other, you're going to have to follow Jesus Christ at the expense of your family. And I'll tell you right now, I'm still, you know, fairly small in ministry, but even on my small level, I have written back and forth with many, many, many people all over the world. Don't even know each other. They're not coordinating and, you know, and and all giving me the same story. No, these people are all over the world, North America, Canada, you know, other nations, it's, it's incredible. And they all go through the same thing. My family says I'm nuts. They don't want anything to do with me. Yeah. Why? Because they stand for the King James Bible. That's going to happen. You say, well, is there some other way around? Is there, is there a lower cost that I can pay? Can I get a discount on this item? No. Full price. Sorry. It's the way it is. Just the way it is. Look down at verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Oh, well, that means that you should sell everything and just be homeless and go live on top of a mountain somewhere and then you can be... No. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you have to give everything up. But it means that you have to put it on the altar and say, I'll sacrifice whatever you want me to do, Lord. And it could be the Lord will let you get along with some members of your family. It could be the Lord will keep you well and well fed and you know i mean you read through the bible and they were being per persecuted put in prison there are christians that that have a very sanctified life and they don't go through that they're not martyred for jesus and whatever that doesn't make them less of a disciple okay i'm, I'm not saying that you have to totally physically give everything up but you have to put it on the altar and say whatever it's going to cost me lord i'm going to pay it okay i want that perfect will of god for my life i know it's a high cost but I'll pay whatever I have to. Okay? Uh, go back a couple chapters to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. Okay, Luke chapter 6, verse 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil, and here's the qualifier, for the Son of Man's sake. If you're a rotten individual and people don't want to be around you, uh, you're not doing it right. <laughs> okay, it should be for the Son of Man's sake. Verse 23, Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. That's rough. You see, when you decide to follow Jesus Christ and your family goes another way and they say, hey, you need, to, you need to quit talking about this stuff. You need to give up these weird beliefs of yours. And you say, no, I'm not going to do that. It's not about you saying, I, I, I hate you. I don't want any to... No, it's actually them that will separate from your company. You know what? You don't even need to come around anymore if you're going to talk that way. We don't want to be around you. I want to keep my kids away from you. That's the kind of stuff that's going to happen. Okay? And what happens? What should your should be your reaction? Oh, why would God do this to me? I don't understand. This isn't fair. What you, no. Leap for joy. Rejoice in that day. 
you're counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. Read that in the book of Acts. They're actually being beaten. And they're going out and rejoicing, praising the Lord for it. That's something. See, that goes against the flesh. See, that's a high price. Very high price. Verse 24. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. You know, they laugh at you if you're a Bible believer. But guess what it's going to be for those that are saved when they hit the judgment seat of Christ. And Jesus is up there on the throne and he says, why did you mock my word? Why did you stand for those new versions that come from the Catholic Church? Why did you do that? Uh, 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 uh. Laugh now. Go ahead. You're going to weep someday. Verse 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. You know, I have uh, people that I know, I'll say it that way, and they're loved by the world. They get along real well with the world. Very well. Why? Well, I think some of them aren't saved. I know some of them aren't saved. Yeah. They don't want to pay the price. Okay? Uh, We're going to go to... 2 Corinthians chapter 2 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Hit a couple more verses here. If you want the perfect will of God, I'm going to show you what you need to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. And this is great. I love this scripture here. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 15, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death and to the other the savor of life unto life and who is sufficient for these things. To a saved person, when we meet up with a fellow Bible believer, it's like meeting a brother or sister. Okay? That's the neat thing. You will forsake your your family according to the flesh, but when you meet up with other Bible believers that are right and that are doing things for the Lord, it's just like family, closer than family. I mean, I'm closer to, to you guys here this morning than I am to my own family, my own brothers and sisters. Why? We're on the same level here. Okay, We believe the same things. We are in the same mind, same judgment. It's great. Uh but it's interesting there. It says, to the one, we are a savor of death unto death. <laughs> you know how the lost world perceives us? <laughs> savor of death unto death. You know, they make a lot of movies, and I don't, I don't watch them, I don't recommend them. They're filthy garbage movies. But they have this thing about zombies. You know, these, these undead people walking around. That's how the lost world views you. I remember Derek and I, the one time we were going, the day we were out on the street ministry thing, and, you know, we were Liberty Baptist Church at that point, and we were wearing, you know, nice pants, nice shirt, and a tie. I didn't have suit jackets on. But I remember I was carrying this Bible right here, my big King James Bible. And we were walking down the street, and there was people coming towards us. And, and they'd, you know, they'd be smiling and looking around. And they'd look up, and they'd see us, and they'd drop their heads, you know. And, they, and they'd, the one guy crossed the street, went across the street, got on the other side of the street and was looking towards the building. You know, it was like, what's the problem? Yeah, there, it's, there's something wrong there. They're ashamed. There's a sin that they have and they don't want to run into one of the, you know, zombies walking by, <laughs> a Christian. They hate the idea. They don't like that book, you know. And, that, and that's another reason why, by the way, I'm against a lot of these new versions. They're trying to make the Bible look stylish. Why? They don't want the shame. They don't want to pay the price. Interesting. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to see one of the reasons why people uh, think of us as being dead. In a sense, in a sense, we are dead to the world. Or at least we should be. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 3 through 5. It says here, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, 
lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. That's what the world enjoys. They like revelings. Let's go party. You know? Oh, it's a holiday. That's a, that's a good excuse. Let's go out and get drunk. Mm-hmm. You know? But look what it says here. Verse 4. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. Hey man, you going to go out drinking this weekend? No, I'm going to stay home and read my Bible. <gasps> what? Huh? What kind of weirdo are you? Well, I'm part of a sect. Okay? We're called Christians. You ought to be part of it. Well, how do I get in? Some kind of secret code or I've got to know somebody or something? No. Well, you've got to know somebody. Yeah. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay? That's how you get in. <laughs> well, then I can't, give, I can't go out and do all the banquetings and ridings, revelings and all that stuff? No. Okay, ridings isn't in there. you know. But uh, verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Isn't that interesting? In Ephesians it says, You hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Who really is the zombie? They are. Not us. They view you like you're the zombie. They view you like you're the dead one, savor of death on a death. But in reality, it's them. Okay? And they're going to get to die for all of eternity. I can't imagine that. You know? I mean... It, if I'm ever in a car accident or something like that and I see the thing burst into flames and I'm trapped or whatever, well, in my mind, it's going to be, oh, boy, I'm not going to enjoy this, but it's going to be over. When you go to hell, it's not going to be over. I can't fathom that. I mean, we can kind of, well, you know, that man, that'd be bad. We can't really understand that. It's never going to be over. Never going to end. Incredible. <clears throat> Okay, now let's go on to level number two. Okay, you had the perfect level. You have the acceptable level. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. In the book of Galatians, you have a lot of the Jews were messing around with Christians and they were trying to bring them back under the law. Okay? Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. It's really weird. I know we talked about this when we went through the book of Galatians, but it's really weird how that you actually look better upon if you're some kind of a, if you act peculiar in the flesh. If you're just a plain old Bible-believing Christian, the world hates that, you know? Why? Because you're basically, you're, your life is saying, I'm right, you're wrong. So a lot of people say, well, well let's not do that. Let's, uh, you should be circumcised. You should start living like a Jew. And you should start going around and you should start acting like you're Jewish. Don't say Jesus Christ. Okay? Change the name to something that's Hebrew. You know, which I'm, I'm not against, you know, Hebrew and stuff like that, obviously. But the Bible's very clear how you're supposed to live. And a lot of these people, they start doing that stuff. Why? So they can get away from the persecution that comes from being a King James Bible believer. They don't like that. Okay? So, level number two, people see the perfect will of God and they see how the world views you and how the world's going to hate you and despise you and they say, I don't want to pay quite that high of a price. I want to be a Christian, but I want to just take it down a notch or two so I don't have to suffer persecution. You know, a lot of people do that. First Timothy chapter six. Jump over there quick. First Timothy chapter six. And I'm going to show you this is going to be one of the big ones. Why a lot of people uh, will ex- take the acceptable level and not the perfect level. First, First Timothy chapter six, verse ten. <laughs> one of the most familiar ones. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, we use this verse a lot on the lost world, but in context, it's for saved people. It doesn't say that they lost their salvation, by the way. It says that they've erred from the faith. They dropped down a notch from the perfect will to the acceptable will. You see, living as a Bible-believing Christian... It's going to cost you something. You're not going to be able to be Mr. Career, okay, and going out there and being 
a big shot. Because when you get in, out into the professional world, you will realize very quickly that to make it to the top of the corporate ladder requires you to cut some corners. Okay? And if you're witnessing to people and people know you're a Christian, you're not going to advance very quickly in a secular company. So a lot of people see that and they go, well, I kind of like to have a, some riches here and some, some wealth and things and I don't think I want to go quite the route of, of the perfect will of God. I, I think I'll drop down to the acceptable. It doesn't co cost quite as much. You know, I'll, I'll drop down to that level. Uh, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'll look at a couple more here. And you're going to see a good description of modern day professing Christianity. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous Perilous times shall come. Are we living in perilous times? Amen. Yeah, you better believe it. Verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good. Uh-oh. Oh, you're one of the King James only cult people. <clears throat> See? Uh-huh. Verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Hmm. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Oh, but we're all to get along. We're all to, you know, let's just uh, put aside our differences and so we can get along. And, you know, let's tolerance, diversity. Wrong. Nope. Sorry. You know, I've gone to a lot of churches and I try to have grace. And, you know, if you go to a church or something, I know there's still some good ones down south. You know, I've written with people back and forth. They still have some good Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing, let me clarify, churches down there. Okay? If you're going to one, you can't expect the pastor to be 100% in agreement with you. Okay? You need to have a little bit of grace. Okay, if he has some standards and some things and, and you don't quite agree with it, well, have a little bit of grace. Okay, I have some friends, uh, they're good Christians, but we don't get along in everything and every point. Okay, fine, whatever, you know, it's not major things, it's not major doctrine. Okay, you need to have a little bit of grace. But if you're going to a church and, you know, Jesse was talking about the one where this, this guy is, has been attacking the King James Bible, and it's getting more and more and more, and now he's starting to put new version verses into the bulletin. Well, we, we, I think we need to just keep going there, I think, because they, you know, they're, he's a god. No. Get out of there. Okay? Get out of that place. And I know all of us here have gone to churches, and we really want to be part of the thing, but it's just like you see the compromise, and you're going, they're not going to change. I have to leave. That's just the way it is. Okay? Um, and they do that. Why do they do that? Well, because they don't want to go to that perfect level. They want to go to the acceptable. They want to have lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Well, I, you know, I, I just, you know, yeah, maybe I should study my Bible more, but, you know, there's uh, this on or that on a TV, or there's, you know, this activity or that activity. Yeah, you know, I just, yeah. yeah, acceptable. Not the perfect. Okay? Finally, the good level. Okay? 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now there's, this is probably the majority, not probably, this is the majority of professing Christianity right now, is the good level. They don't want the perfect, they don't want to pay the cost, they don't want the even the acceptable. Okay? They want the good where they're saved, and that's about it. <laughs> they're not doing anything for the Lord. They're part of some church where they go once a week, they do their Sunday thing, and that's about it. And there are some that are truly saved, but they see the cost, the high cost, and they say, I don't want to pay that. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, 
and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Okay? Verses 2 and 5 are for the Bible believer. Verses 3 and 4 explains what you're going to run into out there in the world. That's the good level. The cheap, El Cheapo model of Christianity. I don't want to hear about negative things. I don't want to hear about the Bible version issue. I don't want to be against Catholicism. I don't want to have to debate with people. I just want to just coast along and be loved as a good person and do good deeds for people. You know, we have a local church down here in Hopeland, a Methodist church, and they send out flyers. Uh, contact us and we'll send our youth over to, to rake your leaves and to, to do yard work. No evangelism, but boy, they sure are loved in the community. They do a lot of nice projects. See, they move from the gospel of Jesus Christ to the social gospel. How can we help you? We have lots of services, free clothing banks, free food for people. They do all this nice stuff, but they don't offend anybody. They don't like the offense of the cross. They don't want that. See, they want the good. And, I, and, you know, probably those people, I'm sure that there are people there in that church that are truly born again, that are saved. But they're so in love with this world that they can't break with it. They don't want to pay the high cost of the perfect will of God. They don't want it. Okay, look at verse 10. And here you have a, a guy that's actually named. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Here you have a guy, Demas, which is actually mentioned by name. He loved the present world. He was with them at one point in time, but he loved the world so much that he said, I, I, I got to get back to my job, guys. I mean, I, I, I you know... I don't I don't want to quite, you know, say this stuff here. How many Christians were raised in King James Bible believing churches and they now have departed and gone over to the modern church? Why? They love this present world. Uh we're not going to turn there, but Luke chapter 9 verse 62, and Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, fellowship with the Lord. Okay? And when you put your hand, and I'll say this, to the King James Bible, and you begin to do the work with this book, and you start getting the persecution, and you start to get the suffering, and you start getting your family turning against you, and you go, well, maybe I shouldn't take quite as strong a stand on that. Maybe I should compromise. Uh, I think I'm going to go over to that church over there. They're not quite as radical. Mm -hmm. You're not fit for the kingdom of God. And you can fake it all you want and say, oh, I, I love Jesus and everything. No, you don't. Jesus said, if a man love me, he'll keep my words. You don't love Jesus when you attack the King James Bible. And, and it's funny because a lot of these people that formerly were Bible believers and now they're not, guess who they attack? They, don't, they no longer speak against the Catholic Church. They no longer speak against the real cults and warn them. They'll talk against you as a Bible believer. Just the way it is. First Timothy chapter 1. Not too many more verses here. Just a couple more. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 19. Uh, here's another interesting thing. It says here, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And again, Paul names them of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. I can't remember the name of the story, uh, the Iliad or the... I forget, I forget what it was, but it's part of uh, Greek mythology, I think, Odyssey. and there was a... Odyssey, 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 is it? Yeah. And there was a story about how that they were sailing along and there were these sirens, these these mm -hmm. women's spirits or whatever, and they were over on the rocks and they would sing to the sailors and the sailors would turn their boat over to hear the beautiful singing and they'd smash the boat on the rocks. Okay, that was just a make up, made up story. But it, you know, it kind of illustrates a good point. You're sailing along as a Christian doing the will of the Lord 
and you start to hear the, that siren song coming from the world. And, you know, you, you start to go along in this life and you begin to hear the sounds of the, of the world and the course of the world and you start seeing things and it can draw you away. And if it draws you away too much, you stop reading the word, you stop witnessing the people, you stop praying, it will you will be wrecked, shipwrecked. Okay? Just the way it is. Okay. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. Just a couple more places to turn to here. I'm going to go to Revelation 3 and then to John, and then we're done. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3. Uh, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in the, my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Jesus is standing at the door knocking. He wants you to have the perfect will of God. But you're going to have to pay the price for it. He isn't going to pay it for you. He paid for your sins on Calvary. But sanctification that comes after salvation, that's up to you to pay. Okay? You're to present your body as a living sacrifice. John chapter 14. Here's where we're going to end it. In John chapter 14. <clears throat> And here's one of the verses that the world just can't stand. John 14, 6. You ought to have this one memorized. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's the head of our sect telling us exactly what to believe. And notice he says that he is the truth. Okay? Well, I don't, I don't want to you know, argue over differences and the truth and stuff. You're rejecting Jesus Christ when you reject truth. You should have a love for the truth. Okay, look at verse 23. Remember Jesus said he's standing at the door knocking? Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Okay? Just having a King James Bible in your home isn't going to do anything for you. You say, well, I'm keeping the word. Well, you're keeping the book, but if you don't open it, it's not going to do you any good. You need to keep his words, not only by having a King James Bible and reading the King James Bible, but by believing it and changing your life accordingly. If this book tells you to do something, you submit to it. Okay, that's keeping the word. And when you do that, it says there, we will come unto him and make, you know, my father will love him and we will come unto to him and make our abode with him. Wouldn't that be good? Look over at uh, verse 7 of chapter 15. Excuse me. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. You want answers to prayer? You better stay in the book. And I've said this before in other uh, messages but one of the reasons that you'll have answers to prayer when you are a Bible believer is because you'll pray accordingly to this book. You will not pray for things that are not in here. You know, oh, oh, God, please make me rich. No, <laughs> you won't pray that because you know what 1 Timothy 6.10 says. You won't err from the faith and pierce yourself through with many sorrows. Okay, but we're going to read real quick here and then we'll finish uh, verses 1, chapter 15, verse 1 through 7. Now this, let me just say this, these verses are not about salvation, okay? They are about your life, sanctification after Christian, you know, after you get saved, okay? It says here, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit, Okay? Now, people would say, well, that means that you lose your salvation. He taketh away and, and, you know, you lost your salvation. No, that's not what it means. As I said, this has nothing to do with salvation, eternal salvation. This is after you are saved, your Christian walk. 
If you are bearing fruit for the Lord, it doesn't say that he'll give you more water and more fertilizer and more. No, he purges you so that you can bring forth more fruit. Your family will turn against you. You will start to, to suffer persecution. What's going on? You're being purged. You know, that's just the way it's going to be. It's like the Lord hands you something and he says, okay, I want to watch what you're going to do with that before I hand you something greater. You know, and when he sees, okay, you're faithful in this, now I'm going to give you more responsibilities. You're faithful in that, I'll give you more. It's a process, okay? Verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Oh, I can bear fruit without staying in the King James Bible, without a right relationship with Jesus Christ. No, you can't. Oh, but we had a concert, you know, we had a rock concert, Christian rock concert, and we had 3,000 people come forward for decisions. No, you didn't. They made decisions, but it wasn't of the Lord. Why? They're not abiding in his book. The Bible says you're not to conform to the world. You are not to give them the world so that they can be saved or something. No, no. You're to do the work of the Lord according to the word of God. Okay, verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. What happens when a boat wrecks on the rocks? It splinters into pieces. That's really good for nothing but to burn. <laughs> uh, what did the Bible just say back there where we read about these men making shipwreck? That's what happens when you are not bearing fruit, when you're not abiding in the word of God. You'll make shipwreck. And at that point, basically, you're really good for nothing at that point. And of course, verse 7, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. But real quick here before I finish, verse 2, it says there, Beareth, or wait, here is it, where, no, 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 Beareth fruit, about the third line down, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Yeah, the good, yeah, the acceptable. Uh, verse 5, um, the same bringeth forth much fruit. So you have three different levels of fruit there. Fruit-bearing Christians. Getting saved and going to a church and being a good person, well, there's a little tiny bit of fruit there. The fruits of the Spirit will probably be in their life. Okay, fine. But it's just going to be a little tiny bit. You want to bear more fruit, you're going to have to go up to the acceptable level. You want a grape or a watermelon? Yeah. yeah. You know, you're going to have to go up. But if you want to go to the perfect level where you bear much fruit, it's going to cost you. And it's going to cost you a lot. And one of the things that you are going to be told is that you are part of a cult. It's going to happen. you know. And, and I know there are a lot of new believers that are listening to this thing. You're just getting started out. And I'm telling you, you might not be experiencing much of it right now, but you're going to see it. You're going to see more and more and more people calling you, a cult member, you're part of a sect, you're part of whatever, you're just going to have to get over that. Okay? You should go for the perfect level. Be willing to pay the cost. And let me tell you something, you can learn a lot. Right now there's some real good sermons. Sermon Audio has some good stuff on it. Uh, there's a, a Ruckmanite.com has a lot of old-time Baptist you know, preachers on it. You can really get a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of books, a lot of video, a lot of audio. You can learn a lot of things. And that's fine to hear good preaching. But you're going to have to get in that book yourself. And you're going to have to learn. And you're going to have to get out on the street. And you're going to have to have application for what you're studying. That's going to cost you something. Okay? It's just the way it is. Well, I read a story about this preacher. And, and boy, he really suffered with his family. Now I'm sanctified. No. You're going to have to pay that cost yourself in your own life. It's going to happen. Okay? As always, uh, 
if you have any kind of questions or anything or, or I haven't made something clear, please get in contact with us. Okay, don't be shy. Don't think, oh, you know, they won't answer us. They're too high and mighty or something. That's not at all true. Uh, we love hearing from new believers. We love to be able to answer questions. And you need to be careful uh, who you get in contact with, who you get in touch with. I mean, there's a lot of very false prophets out there, false ministries. Okay, um, so I guess that's it for this morning. Uh, just strive to be in the Word, get things done for the Lord, and do not be pressured into giving up absolute truth. So that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the Word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.